community that's tainted with drug use and abuse doesn't necessarily look like what you're probably thinking. It isn't a couple of guys on the downtown corner in Detroit looking to sell somebody some drugs whilst itching their wrists because they are also on drugs. It isn't fent zombies walking down your local sidewalk in Canada. No, in fact, the community can look really special. And this might sound shocking to people who aren't necessarily in the know with things like this, but the drug using community can be filled with some good people. Now, I'm not talking about just any drug, of course. You see, in America, steroids have been touted as this really horrible thing, specifically using steroids as a pure criminal and degenerate behavior. However, when you take your American glasses off and look at the rest of the world, what you see is that this is truly just a fraud in America. You're a fake and a fraud. You can see them in basically every other country as a normal part of society. You can walk down to your local pharmacy, pick up your testosterone, and maybe even growth hormone for a couple bucks. Yes, a couple bucks. All while getting the guidance that you need from the pharmacist that's providing you help. And it's a shame, really, because there's some amazing people within the steroid user space that can help and do have a lot of intelligence that people just simply neglect because, well, they're drug users. And of course, with the good always comes the bad. I'm not denying this, but I think it's really important that we point out the flaw in some of the viewpoints that people have. For instance, steroid users constantly dying. People are scared of self-driving vehicles because they just simply don't understand them. So whenever a crash does take place in a self-driving vehicle, it is immediately published and spoken on in a negative light, as if all autonomous vehicles are highly dangerous and deadly to the people using them. While in 2021, the National Law Review found quite the opposite. In fact, there is almost double the incidence of normal drivers causing crashes and entering accidents with even high fatality risks compared to autonomous vehicles. And in fact, autonomous vehicles lead to much less crashes, almost again, half of what you and I driving would do per year. So if you are someone driving an autonomous vehicle, while yes, there's going to be risks implied, it isn't nearly as dangerous as driving your own vehicle or trusting public transportation. And by this logic, the group of people using steroids isn't massive. It's for sure huge, but it's not massive. So by nature, when a group of people points a finger at steroid users and says that they're all unhealthy and going to die, it looks like a lot worse than it really is. And especially if someone does actually die within that small community. The news can spread quickly, and it's an easy group to point fingers at because it is so niche, and so the media fires up a storm. However, there is one person in this past decade who has really tried to make a difference, tried to arguably and objectively make things safer within the community of steroid users. This isn't just his own thoughts, but this is clinically acclaimed information, breaking down science that many people don't dig into as it relates to steroid users, and also getting experts to talk on his own channel with his own money for the sake of bodybuilders everywhere. That person is vigorous. Steve, the drug lord of PED use everywhere. Before we discover who Vigorous Steve is, I have to make a clear and obvious statement. I am a dear friend of him, and so in your eyes, it might have a natural bias in this video, and I want to clearly state that I'm going to be as objective as humanly possible here, if it hurts the relationship or not. My goal is not to provide you a complete puff piece, it is to provide you real information and dissect a human's character. Steve, or a real name, Stefan, given to him because Thai people struggle to say Stefan, didn't start his journey as a bodybuilding influencer as many people do in the current era. Far from it, in fact. He started his journey, as far as we know it, with traveling away from his hometown Holland, which he clearly doesn't identify as being Dutch anymore. And then where did you, what uh, country did you grow up in? Oh, Holland. Holland. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I don't really identify as being Dutch anymore. I have a Dutch mm -hmm. passport, but I've traveled all over the world now, and I, I feel it's a very small-minded country. Then again, this from what I remember, I haven't been there in like 17 years yeah. properly, so. He felt that it was a very small-minded country, people judged him, and people in general only sought out one way of life for themselves, get a professional job, and retire once you're ready to basically die. Stefan didn't see that as an option for himself, however. There was an economic crisis in 2009, which hit Holland quite hard, and it was during this time that Steve had actually gotten laid off from his job. He was 
was doing some consultancy and was making a very, very reasonable wage. He was what we would consider to be wealthy in normal terms. But during the 2009 economic crisis in Holland, he had lost his job. And it was during this time that he traveled all over Asia for nearly 50 weeks before returning home to Holland. He did everything from traveling across the deserts on camels to eventually the jungles of Thailand and soon the inner cities of Bangkok. During this time, he was very obsessed with training and fitness and definitely having a physique that was highly commendable, as was he before the trip to Asia. Of course, on this 50-week trip, he really lost a lot of his body composition and the fitness physique that he had, but he still aspired to do whatever he could to maintain it, simply because this is something he learned in his youth, and it wasn't something that he was going to escape from easily. You see, Steve's mom introduced him to training when he was just 15. So my mom introduced me to bodybuilding, or it introduced me to the gym mm. when I was 15, and then I think I got my hands dirty with steroids when I was 26. I don't know, I started doing research about steroids when I was 21. Mm. Right. Just reading up on it and so forth? Yeah, reading up on it, and I never felt that I was ready uh, until I was 26. Mm. And I think many people who are fitness aware had someone in their life to be an aspiration for them while they were young, and that does seem to be Stefan's case here. What's interesting is that his source of influence was his mother. This might actually be something of a viable point to make for his character later on, which I'll connect these dots a bit later. When Stefan returned home, he realized a few things. One, he was never really happy in Holland with the situation that he had there, people being highly judgmental towards bodybuilders and individuals who were really interested in looking more muscular, but as well the economic situation, plus he didn't feel like it was quite home after his trips around Asia. He had a comfortable lifestyle and a very well put living income, but the consultancy position never really made him happy. In fact, it stressed him out more than it made him content. Losing the position during the economic crisis was actually probably one of the best things to have ever happened to him. And many people who do make that upper tier income can relate. Once people often talk about quote unquote making it, it does seem that their passion was never actually found in the process. Sometimes in life, I think it's far worth it to step back a few dozen times to reach a better vantage point in life. It's similar to prestiging in a video game, actually. All your progress gets wiped once you max out, but in spite of that, you have now a new threshold to reach, which was higher than ever before, and slightly more satisfying. Even though you have to consider the fact that you've just lost everything and you're having to start over again. And this is where Steve leaves Holland, and decides that Thailand was the best place for him to be, as well as his new home. And it is at this point where, as we define it, vigorous Steve truly becomes who he is today. His career as a bodybuilder that's actually really influential and a fitness coach starts here too. Once he got to Thailand, he started a YouTube channel to document what he was doing as someone who was fitness centric in a foreign country. He used this channel to also gain clients, showing how he was staying fit because in Thailand, there's not many people who have a good expertise on how to stay fit. As well, this soon garnered him attention within the competitive ranks of bodybuilding in Thailand and he became a very well-renowned coach within the Bangkok area. And when Steve had gone to Thailand, he was already an enhanced bodybuilder, having done much of his research on the topic of enhancements or using pharmaceuticals. He was clearly bigger and had more expertise than many people from the country. This is due to Thailand's lack of access to information that Steve or other Westerners would have obviously had and his foothold here, and so begins the foothold into his new source of income after losing a pretty sizable one, as did the start of a really interesting relationship with a young Thai girl, who was also very intrigued by fitness. More on this later. <laughs> As Stefan started to get more experience within the space of bodybuilding and peaking athletes for bodybuilding, it was where he needed to learn more. To him, it was never really worth it to compete. He was behind the scenes, he cared far too much about his own health, and to be very clear, he was more interested in building a business as it was to him a main source of income. His knowledge was already highly extensive on manipulating physiques and peaking people for shows, especially when it came to the nuance of nutrition. As you can 
can see in these pictures of his YouTube channel, which I pulled from the Wayback Machine, this is circa 2011. His content was all about making healthy diets, grocery shopping, and so much more as it pertains to fitness. And this part, he hasn't really shared his drug expertise quite yet. But he mentions that during this time, he had garnered much of his intelligence from forums and talking to other well-known coaches in the bodybuilding scene. And how did you uh, like really start to really learn about steroids? Was it uh, I think maybe a little bit the way Derek did through like forums and stuff? Yeah, so that's where we all started, right? We started reading on the forums and then you realize that a lot of people are making mistakes or that they're mm. full of shit or they're just arguing about scientific evidence that's <laughs> extrapolated from sick people, right? right? So I, I realized, okay, there's some anecdotal reports, there's a lot of bro science. Why don't I just get started from the bottom and, and research human biology? Mm. So that's how I got interested more in doing the research. So we began to surf PubMed on his free time and listen to other bodybuilding coaches like Skip Hill and Dante Trutel and many more old timers that you might not actually be aware of. Comparing their information to that on the forums and then also to real clinical research. Of course, this gave him a pretty clear window into what people were doing and obviously some of that being extremely harmful and potentially dangerous. Sometimes even having very clear protocols that were honestly ineffective altogether. So as Stefan was cooking in the background, building his knowledge base and building his soon to be known reputation, he was coaching Thai athletes at the front lines, which is exactly how he met Nan, his wife now and the young Thai girl I had mentioned earlier. They got married in 2016, a year after I actually graduated high school. Before this, Nan was just a client with benefits and, of course, an amazing work ethic. Nan won three championships and was recognized by the Thai government as the best bodybuilder many years in a row. And this was all under the guidance of Steve, who helped her every step of the way. Eventually, the two had spent so much time together that they soon decided it was worth it to just be together, that then leading to a marriage. After getting married and the newfound success with Nan's career being on a pedestal within the country of Thailand, bodybuilding became a really big part of Steve's and Nan's life. And this is really where they started to dive headfirst into his content. As much as I would love to review his old content, it's quite hard, even using old internet archives. Pulling up old YouTube videos is a very tricky business. So a lot of this I can really only explain to you from first-hand experience unless I'm able to find more footage later on. To build your perspective here, Steve started publishing videos about insulin sensitivity, how to stay healthy, and how to build muscles with certain exercise splits. This actually started gaining quite a bit of traction for a small audience on YouTube. People really enjoyed Enjoyed it. A controversial character we have spoken about many times on this account actually, Tony Huge, was also clearly interested in what Steve had to say and he happened to also live in Thailand. Much of Tony Huge has been removed from the internet many different times and since then he's started many new different channels but they all seem to eventually get banned. So a lot of the information that I would like to access about their relationship has also been unfortunately redacted from the internet even using internet archive. While this could be uh, obviously just a issue with the rash statements that Tony often made, it could also be an issue relative to the murder that he maybe could have had his hands in the mix with. But the moral of the story is I can't pull up Tony's old videos either. However, when Steve would find himself in the front of the camera with Tony, they would often share their drug protocols. Extreme in some cases, sure, but mostly talking about what Steve was doing to be smart and healthy, which at the time he would often speak about things like the golden trifecta, testosterone, and insulin and growth hormone being the main mediators to hypertrophy in his eyes. At this time, Steve didn't really like the idea of running non-bioidentical hormones in a steroid cycle, as he thought it was the roads to bad health. As well, these synthetic derivatives of testosterone that were not bioidentical had carrier oils that could be considered toxic due to their synthetic states. Things like ethyl oleate, polyethylene glycol, ethylene glycol, and propylene glycol, as well as Weichel. Ah, I, I know this all sounds quite confusing, so let me briefly explain to give some context. In simple terms, carrier oils are substances used to quote-unquote carry a hormone like testosterone into the body. When you inject testosterone, it needs something to help it absorb smoothly into your system instead of just rapidly entering your bloodstream and giving you a massive spike in an androgen. That's exactly where carrier oils come in. They act like a vehicle for the hormone, letting it be released over time so it works more effectively and safely. There are many types of carrier oils, 
oils, but some are synthetic and can be harsh on the body. For instance, oils like I mentioned, oleate and polyethylene glycol, PEG, are sometimes used to make injections smoother, but they can be hard for the body to process and even cause some pretty radical reactions. That's why some people are very cautious about using synthetic carrier oils as they could lead to high degrees of inflammation, which could also lead to cardiovascular issues later down the road. Organic carrier oils, on the other hand, are quite the opposite. Things like grapeseed oil don't necessarily cause the large degrees of inflammation that these synthetic carrier oils would. And Steve was really the pioneer of this discussion. He was the first one to really publish information about these synthetic versus organic carrier oils and part of the reason why he was so big on the bioidentical hormone usage. So Steve then developed many YouTube videos on his own channel about the subject. Extending his reach beyond simple recipes for food and exercises, he was now breaching into the drug stuff. These videos quickly brought a new audience. People loved Steve's complex breakdowns of matters related to steroids and pharmacology, as well as how to be healthy as a bodybuilder using these things. And what really gave him this willingness to share information, which would have been seen as taboo, was Tony Huge. Aspiration of kids now, they want to be an influencer. I right? know social media. I, I'm, I'm a little bit old school, I guess. I just kind of fell into it. I think, you know, I was with Tony Huge, right, like years ago. He kind of yeah. gave me my first lift off. I just met him at Olympia actually last yeah, week. Yeah, I saw him there also. So I did videos with Tony and then I was always a little bit nervous about the comments and I would read all of them and it would be a little bit off-putting. Like, maybe this is not for me, you know? And then, but then I got a lot of positive response. So I felt like doing more videos with Tony, but he would only upload like 25% of them. Because <laughs> yeah, maybe the, his, he didn't agree with the opinion or he thought it was too controversial or people wouldn't understand what I was talking about. So after a while, I was like, you know what? If I want to put this content out there, I'll just make my own YouTube channel and, and give my own information, right? So I, thanks to Tony, people already knew about me and I had a little bit of a following on Instagram. So I was able to move people to my channel. Tony Huge was at the time making a killing posting content about really abstract information about pharmacology. He would talk about things that people have never even heard of, and not just that, but also experiment with them. Of course, he turned this into a thing of glorifying steroids and selling bunk products that were said to be steroids, but that is for a different story in which I've already made a video about. As Steve posted more steroid advice, more people seemed to come to his content and engage, and it got to a point where Steve knew he could make a living doing something like this instead of running around coaching athletes all over the world. So he started one of the first first paid groups in bodybuilding ever. And this group was on Facebook. He would share articles and privately found information with the audience of this Facebook group. Furthermore, he would even provide detailed advice to the subscribers as well, giving them clear instructions on how to peak for a show or the post-show rebound phase. Actually, back in this era, I was a member and I had asked him several questions about my post-show rebound, specifically rehydration tactics after using diuretics. Quite literally, Steve helped me make sure I wasn't harming myself beyond recovery while I was working with, well, less versed coaches who decided harsh diuretics were a must and this is obviously a very common trend we see in bodybuilding. And at this time, I was one of the lovely members of the group and Steve helped me out a ton and this was shortly before he actually took the whole group down together. There was at least 170 members by my count and that was quite a bit of money. At this time, it would have have been netting him somewhere around 5,000 to 7,000 USD per month based on just the Facebook group alone, which in Thailand, you have a king's living at that kind of monthly income. I know it doesn't sound like a whole lot to Americans or Canadians, but in Thailand, that is basically all you need to live a very luxurious life. So this cycle producing content began, restricting his coaching to one-on-one -on -one by increasing the prices and then offering group alternatives to be better instead of paying for direct coaching so he would have less work to do, and then closing the groups and coaching all together to just simply offer consultations only. He would do this over time while advertising each option of getting his advice on each video, a rudimentary method of marketing, but one that was still highly effective for his small pond of very loyal followers. Over time, 
this bought much of Steve's time back, and it allowed him to publish more content as well as research much more in depth about the matters he was discussing. He went from a guy sitting on his couch, mouth breathing very heavily, to somebody who actually had an editor, thumbnails, titles, and generally really great production on YouTube. In these videos, he wouldn't just tell you what he was doing, but it started to actually transition into how Steve went through these research papers and then starting to discuss the nuance with his audience, and then of course providing practical takeaways for their specific drug protocols through the research that he had done. At this time, there was no one else on the internet doing anything like this. Most people would just say what they found from their own experiments, but not actually provide any clinical data. Now, this was one of the biggest times in Steve's online era. Not only did he start to rapidly grow his channel in this era, but of course, in this late 2019, early 2020, he started to develop really catchy thumbnails and appearing on many other channels very frequently, channels that were actually bigger than his own. But interestingly, during this time, it was also where he had an ultrasound on his liver. He had some scary labs come up in which it might have indicated he had some cancer. So he did a full body ultrasound and quickly found out that his liver had developed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. NAFLD, or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, is a condition where fat builds up in the liver, even in people who don't drink alcohol. In simple terms, the liver starts just to store too much fat, which can slow down or even lead to the liver damaging over time, as well as a host of other metabolic issues. In fact, one in three Americans who have a great body mass index have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease often shows up in people who are overweight, but in this instance, in bodybuilders who use steroids, it can happen as well. This is due to having high androgens as well as extremely high caloric intake or necessary gains causing issues with the hepatic system. And it's something you'd ideally want to catch earlier on because left alone and to inhibit your body can seriously cause damage long term. Thankfully, Steve got an early chance to address the issue and address it he did. Welcome to Vigor's Health. I'm Coach Steve. I'm going to go off cycle and do post cycle therapy after seven or eight years of blasting and cruising. So that's going to be very, very interesting. But you guys can uh, watch me shrink over the next three months, um, which is always going to be, you know, fun in the comment field. Like, what happened to your shoulders? And why is your face so small? Well, I'm doing a post cycle therapy. So you guys be generous. During this time, he did what nobody would have ever done completely came off of cycle, all peptides, everything to include even food. See, during this time, he was heavily fasting, completely even for several months, and his body showed it. It changed entirely to include his face, which you can see here. However, it freed up his time entirely too. This newfound time due to not eating or not training or doing much of anything was deposited into more research and video development. The content creation really started to hit its peak around this period. And this is actually something I think all meatheads should do with their time when they're out of training, or something that I would even use to justify deloads. Myself, I love reading, researching, and I am always keeping my nose in a book if it's not watching anime. And so when I'm not training, I have so many more hours in the day to read, to research, and to produce videos just like this one. And finally, when Steve decided to stop fasting, he had lost a total of 30 kilograms. And for those of us who use democracy's measurements, like the stallions of Earth, that's about 66 pounds. Quite literally, couples of children removed from his body body, like the equivalent of them in weight. I mean, I'm not saying like some weird things were removed from his body, like actual children. He wasn't pregnant, but you understand the point. Ah! Oh, no. And this was actually the point in which Steve had completely resolved his non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And as well, it was the turning point for him to actually start using testosterone again and training again after some very, very long time off. We're talking nearly a year. And no, this is without TRT or testosterone replacement therapy. Steve went off completely cold turkey. No hormones at all in his entire body. And now, this is where he started to get his gains back at a pretty reasonably fast-paced level. Level, which made him more confident in many situations, often showing his biceps and check-in photos within videos of him a lot more often. However, now that Stefan was feeling pretty good, training pretty well, and eating a handsome amount of food, he started to take more anabolic. This time, his commitment to health was even more significant, however. 
He states many times that he will keep things minimal as this is something he wants to do for the rest of his life, and a very similar statement to what Rich Biana himself had told his fans. As we currently see in the current day, just before the 2024 Olympia, Steve's cycle has turned into much more. A situation that some people might honestly frown upon. How one person can simply go from such an extreme to care for their health, and then do the exact same thing that had damaged it in the first place. And you'd be right for having that thought. It's odd for someone looking in on this situation. However, if you trained with steroids ever and then came off cold turkey, you might just know what this feels like. It's the one thing that completely destroys the fallacy of meatheads who try to say steroids are not addictive. Let me try to explain in a way that might help you understand a bit better. Try to actually interpret the feeling one might experience. You know that feeling when you're really healthy? Like you just wake up with loads of energy, great libido, a great mindset, no rain clouds over your head, no brain fog or anything like that. Well, imagine that this is you in your current state and you go to bed one night happy as ever, but you wake up the next morning with the flu. You're still able to do basically everything you need to do in life and maybe even make it to work, but it just feels like a complete 180 from where you were just 24 hours ago. So much so that you're now just praying to gods you've never even believed in before to just have it stop and make you feel good again. This is what it feels like to come off of steroids and go train. You were quite literally Superman and then you just turn into a normal human being the next day. And for me, this is why I think a lot of people will perpetually use steroids for most of their life. And again, I do think that the best combatant for this sort of perpetual mistake is to find other things to do with your time, especially hobbies that you can allocate your passion to. For me, that's combat sports, reading, and research. As well as once I'm done with this channel and making these kind of videos, whenever that might be, my goal is to make a YouTube channel that's based around video game reviews. And if you have no passion that will replace your current passion, it's going to be very depressing to try to stop doing what is your primary passion. Life just suddenly seems a whole lot duller if you're not doing something you pretty much love every day. Now, to be completely fair, Steve's cycles before this whole incident were much larger, like two grams of testosterone plus larger. So it's no doubt that it's clearly better and more healthier, if you want to say that, than what he was doing before, but it's still not the best thing in the world. Stefan has lost a lot of momentum in his channel. Before he was doing regular podcasts with Derek More Plates More Dates and other really large channels, even interviewing Star Wars Theory, which is a multi-million subscriber channel. Now he has his own live Q&A once weekly and has occasional interviews with the people in the fitness industry or bodybuilding at large. And the real peak to his YouTube career happened when he had leaked some documents from the Liver King. I don't know if you guys quite remember, but the whole Liver King situation with him being exposed as a fake natural. Now, Liver King, known for his ultra-masculine, primal lifestyle, became famous for his extreme approach to health, promoting quote-unquote ancestral living principles like eating raw organ meats and avoiding modern comforts. He claimed that this lifestyle alone was why he achieved such a large and lean physique. He repeatedly insisted that he was completely natural, meaning that he didn't use, very clearly, any performance-enhancing drugs. In late 2022, Derek More Plates More Dates made a very long video exposing this exact topic. And in that video, he showed documents that were emails between him and someone else that discussed very clearly the steroid cycles that Liver King was using. This was a huge revelation and something that damaged Liver King's reputation quite a bit because he built his reputation on preaching that you could look the way that he looks, you could live the lifestyle that he lives and feel the way that he is just by doing the things that he does as as well as using the supplements that he sells. Once exposed, of course, he admitted to the steroid usage. It was pretty hard not to at that point, which was a massive letdown for a lot of his fans. It was such a letdown because most of his fans suddenly realized that his image was, in fact, just a lie. This was a big moment in the fitness industry and drew massive attention, making Steve's channel blow up because he was the one that actually leaked those emails. In the video describing to his audience why he 
release the information, he said, the truth always comes out. It's only a matter of time. With Liver King, it only took half a year. The truth always comes out. It's only a matter of time. With the Liver King, it took one and a half years. And with me, due to all of the internet detectives out there nowadays, it only took two or three days. So whoever pieced it together first and posted it on Reddit, you're obviously a fan. You're part of the Vigorous crew. I guess I owe you a drink. Yes, that was indeed my old questionnaire. And yes, I am the guy that shared those private emails with Derek for more plates, more dates, after more compelling evidence started to surface that the Liver King was indeed using performance enhancing drugs. I don't think it comes to a surprise to anybody in the fitness community, but there were plenty of people out there who believed the lie up until the documentary was released. He goes on to say, if I knew what was going to happen, what the Liver King was going to turn into, I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I hadn't said anything. The information about Liver King was given to Steve in the first place because, well, Liver King asked him. The emails between himself, Liver King, and another person were just correspondence with Vigorous Steve himself. So Steve leaked those emails with the world, going on to say, Take it from me, nobody else on this planet looks like that on TRT just by itself. Going on to then say, ultimately, it's the right thing to do. Yes, it's going to be highly uncomfortable, but the industry deserves the truth. While these statements were highly agreeable, many coaches within the industry disagreed entirely with what Steve had done. Many of the coaches, in fact, that Steve had spoken with and made relationships with prior to this event. For instance, coaches like Skip Hill were saying that Steve broke what would be considered private client privacy, and it was something that their character would simply never allow them to do, even if it gave them all the fame and opportunity. They mentioned that if they did do it, it would completely ruin their integrity as a coach and therefore ruin their career. But did it ruin Steve's integrity? Did it ruin his career? Sure, it might have in some people's eyes and definitely didn't leave the best mark on his name, but I'll leave you to decide that matter on your own and tell me what you think down in the comments below. In any case, Steve's channel gained a lot of new permanent fixtures in terms of subscribers, growing far beyond 100,000 total subscribers in 2023. Still, to this day, Steve is posting content explaining his own experience with a layer of science-based research on top of it, and then breaking down new compounds that no one has ever even used before and explaining why they could make bodybuilding safer or better for everyone involved. Similar to when we had discussed Chase Iron's channel, I think this is actually something very positive, and it's a brilliant thing really that we have the luxury of seeing this stuff. Because not only does it break the taboos about steroid usage, which are basically isolated to America only, it also helps young kids who are glorifying steroid usage on other platforms like Instagram for instance, understand that what they're glorifying is potentially highly dangerous. And then for the other kids who are being influenced by those individuals and do a little bit of research on their own, they're able to find Steve relatively quickly. And due to this, they're able to save themselves from permanent damage and causing issues that they would have never wished upon themselves if they would have known it was going to happen, similar to my own experience. When I started steroids, it was right after I won my natural pro card in the PNBA. I thought it was obviously the right thing to do at that time, and whether it was right or wrong, it got me here to talking to you at this point. That being said, the initial guidance I got was highly destructive to say the absolute least about it. If I hadn't caught on to Steve somehow miraculously before we even had 5,000 subscribers, I would be in a much worse position. I would have hurt myself very early on, before my bodybuilding career had even taken off in any which direction. Thanks to him, I'm one of the healthiest ex-bodybuilders I've ever met. I have hair on my head, relatively clear skin, and I have taken his personal life and truly applied it everywhere else in my life in terms of economics, geographical locations, and you name it. Sometimes women too. <laughs> A lot of the time. A lot of the times, women too. So it might be easy to criticize, again, as someone looking in on this situation, another person talking about drugs openly on the internet, and not only that, but educating about how to use them. And that is fair. However, education on these topics is so damn important. And ultimately, whether you agree with it or not, it's simply still going to happen in massive amounts. You can't change the fact that multi-millions of Americans, each and every single year start 
steroids, not using steroids. See, that's not included in this statistic. They start steroids for the first time. Like it or not, it's this kind of content that reaches people and saves their lives before they actually end them. And content like this really helps the world become more aware with what people in the fitness industry are doing. And the fact that it's not just bodybuilders using steroids and other performance enhancing drugs. It's all sports. And inevitably, some way or in some form, steroids or performance enhancing drugs will be coming across your life at one instance or another. Not you using them, but maybe somebody you know or maybe somebody you know's friend. And it's that point in time in which I hope people have seen some content like Vicarious Steve to understand who that person might be, why they're doing what they're doing, and to understand that it doesn't just immediately make them a drug addict or a horrible person. Steve teaches people to give others a better opportunity at life. And I think just that statement alone, whether it's discussing politics, war, or anything else, is a beautiful thing. It might not be right in your eyes, and it might not even be close to agreeable, but I think we can all say that more people being educated on things that are dangerous is probably a better idea. Similar to how I wouldn't hand a 10-year-old a gas stove and tell him to figure it out. A gas stove is going to be a necessity in his life at some point, and he's going to have to cross paths with it, so I, I might as well teach him how to use use it so there's not a horrible incidence in the future. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and even throw me a cheeky subscribe down below. I really do read all your comments. I love reading them. It's one of my favorite pastimes. I do have a sponsor called Modern Aminos. They're a great company. My discount code is Coach Colton. Now, to be honest, these are research chemicals and you have to be with an institution to get them. But if you head over to that website and you are a part of an institution, that uses research chemicals, you can purchase some of these fine products yourself that are safe, tested, and very viable in many different situations as it relates to neurocognitive health and physical embodiment. In other words, though, I will see you in the next video, my friends. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I will see you around. I don't know where, but if you don't subscribe, seriously, I'll probably start crying. Like, don't even make me cry. Like, bro, I will fucking cry. You want to see? I'll fucking do it. I'll do it. I'm not even fucking playing with you anymore. I said it in the last video, but I'll actually do it. I just got Botox in my forehead, so I actually can't see if I'm moving it or not. Kind of. All right, whatever. Yeah.